Guess what? You can purchase a Mega 65. That's right. You can go out, order your Mega 65 right now. So some of you may be thinking, wow, that's quite a cost there, Stephen. And it really is. There is a cost to the Mega 65. But today I'm going to show you how you can install the Mega 65 Bitstream on a $200 board to give you a hardware Mega 65 that's not an emulation on your Mac or PC. But today we're going to go pure hardware, pure hardware, pure hardware. Now, before we start, this is a pretty lengthy process, so you do need to know that there is a companion blog post with everything you need, including all the links, all the instructions to build your own Mega 65 using a Nexus 4. Now, this project begins after a review of the Mega 65 Developer's Guide. The Developer's Guide is part of a series of Mega 65 user's guides with a focus on the tools and techniques programmers need to develop Mega 65 software. Chapter 16 includes instructions to build a Mega 65 using a Nexus Field Programmable Gate Array, or FPGA. These boards share a Xilinx Arctix A7 found in the dev kit and on the Mega 65. You can purchase a Nexus 4, load a bitstream, and then place files on an SD card and build your own Mega 65 in hardware, albeit with a few caveats, such as no cool Mega 65 case, no floppy drive, and we're missing some of those important ports that we would like to have, like a cartridge port. There are other limitations, but if you want a hardware device to play with while you wait for your Mega 65 to arrive, by the way, were you one of the first 400? This is an option. Now, I will demonstrate using the Nexus 4 that I was able to buy from Digilent for around 200 bucks. The Nexus 4 comes in this spiffy little plastic case and includes the Nexus board and a USB cable. You don't need anything else, except for that SD card, which we'll prepare and talk about later. Before we use the Mega 65 bitstream on the Nexus 4, it's important to understand the input-output features of the hardware necessary for this project. Let's talk about each of these components. Now, I'm not going to cover every hardware feature of the Nexus 4. That is way beyond the scope of this video. But I am going to focus on the hardware features that are important for this project. The micro USB port provides two functions, power and serial connection. This project will use the micro USB port to provide power to the Nexus 4 since I don't have an external power supply on order and don't plan to order one at this time. The micro USB port requires a supply that provides 4.5 5 volts up to 5.5 volts DC and at least one amp. For this project, consider using a 2 to 3 amp as reading the SD card could require more power and you don't want your Nexus 4 just shutting down on you. Now, Jumper JP3 selects the proper power supply, so be sure and check out the companion blog post to make sure that your jumper is set correctly. Let's talk a little bit about the input output devices on the Nexus 4. The Nexus 4 includes slide switches a USB port for keyboard and mouse devices, VGA for video out, and a three and a half millimeter jack for audio. Now the slide switches aren't required for this project, but you wanna make sure that they're all in the down position. And the next thing you need is a keyboard, a USB keyboard. This is the hardest part of this entire, I'm not kidding, this is the hardest part of this entire project. I tried many keyboards. I tried a Monoprice MPM10B, a Unicomp M, a Keychron K2, an Aukey KMG9, a Cano KC KBR101, a generic handheld model RT MWK01. None of them worked. It seems my penchant for excellent mechanical keyboards boards was a detriment to this project. I went online to the Discord and I said, hey, what keyboard do I need for this Nexus 4 to work? And they said, get the dirtiest, cheapest, nastiest keyboard you can find. And of course, what brand did they recommend? Dude, I got a Dell. The LT100. This is the only thing I could find that would work. Good luck on your search for the Dell LT100. I found this in a recycling bin. If you know of another keyboard that'll work, Post it in the comments below. This is it. Dirtiest, nastiest keyboard. Dell. Blech. Now the next part might be a little tricky for you as well if you don't have a VGA monitor. Good news is I found this wonderful VGA to HDMI converter that you can plug into the Nexus 4 and run to an HDMI 
monitor. Now, I am running this through my, using this adapter through my Blackmagic Design A10 Mini to capture all the video you see here today. So it works and it works really well. So link to that will be in the companion blog post, which the companion blog post will be linked down in the video description. You'd also probably like to hear the game sounds as you're playing them. So there is audio out on the Nexus 4. It uses a standard three and a half millimeter, one eighth inch plug. You can take that, plug that in, plug it into whatever powered output you have. Again, for me, I'm going through the A10 Mini and uh, you can listen to the sounds as you play your games or try to play some songs for yourself using those really cool Mega 65 music and sound commands. Make sure and check those out in the user's guide. After you plug everything in and before you load a bitstream, you probably just want to try the board out and make sure it's working correctly. Good news is there is a self-test program on the board. To use the onboard self-test on the Nexus 4, make sure the Nexus is off. Move the pin on the external configuration jumper that says SD USB to USB as shown. Turn on the Nexus 4 and the self-test will display as shown. The reference manual tells me that the self-test will do the following things. The VGA port displays feedback. It's obviously working well. And the onboard microphone, temperature sensors, accelerometer, RGB LEDs, and USB mouse are all displayed on the self-test. Some users buttons control the color LEDs. For instance, if you press the BTNL button, the BTNC button, or the BTNR button, it'll cause those LEDs, those onboard LEDs, to illuminate and cycle through different colors. A little fun feature of the self-test program is to press the BTNU, and that will trigger a five second recording from the onboard PDM microphone. Say something for five seconds, and then the mono audio will output on that audio channel that we connected earlier and play back that recording. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Connecting a mouse to the USB port will move the mouse, only it didn't work for me. Evidently, like the keyboard, you need a specific type of mouse that I was unable to find, so I cannot demonstrate that for you. And then finally, how much fun is this? The seven segment LEDs below display a moving snake pattern. So that's the self-test. If that's working, then we're ready to start building our Mega 65 and loading the Mega 65 bitstream. Next, we need to build the micro SD card. The micro SD is a two-step process. We're gonna format it once, and then we're gonna format it again. The first time we're gonna format it in FAT32, and that's just going to hold the bitstream file that we're going to download. To format the micro SD card, use whichever tool you need on Mac, Linux, or a PC to format it to FAT32. When you insert the SD card on your computer, it will appear in your Finder if you are on a Mac or in your file management system, depending on whether you're on a Windows or Linux machine. It will also have a title or a name for that SD card. If you want to know what format that is on a Mac, I can hit Command-I after I highlight it. It will tell me it is in a FAT32 format, which is what I want for this project. I could show you how to use disk utility to format this disk, but you know what? That's been done so many times in so many videos, we are not going to waste your time today. A little bit later, we are going to drop a bitstream onto that micro SD card. Now, if you see this, when you boot the bitstream later, that means you need a different micro SD card. So remember this. All right, let's get that bitstream file. A bitstream is the data to load into the FPGA to configure the Nexus 4 hardware to simulate in hardware a Mega 65. You're going to download the latest version of the bitstream at files.mega65.org. This is known as the Mega 65 file host and is the repository for all great software and utilities you need for the Mega 65. You can access files in the file host without having an account. Simply click on files. The difference will be if you have an account, you will be able to access specific files only available to dev kit owners and future Mega 65 owners. For the purpose of this demonstration, I am going to use the official Mega 65 source ROMs. 
Again, these are only available if you're a dev kit owner or a Mega 65 owner. However, there is an open ROM available and you can download that ROM and use it for this project. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we get a ROM file or the SD card files, we need the bitstream file. We're going to go into file search and type bit. That will present a list of the bitstream files available on the file host. You'll see that we have Nexus 4, Nexus 4 DDR, those are two different versions. You need to be very careful. For the Nexus I'm using, I want the Nexus 4 dev.bit. Now you'll also notice that we have bitstream files for the Mega 65 down here. Make sure you don't get confused and download one of those. It has to be specific to the Nexus 4 board. Now I'm gonna click on this link and you'll see that we can get some information about it, including a way to link to that directly if you wanna share that. You'll see the category, the type, the OS, the size of the download, and you'll see the number of downloads. You'll also see when it was published, which is good information to know if you have the latest bitstream. We're going to hit download, and that's gonna download it to our Mac, in my case. Now, you can also, if I close this, you could hit this download button here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. This is going to be in my downloads folder right here. So I'm going to take this right here and I'm going to drag it onto my volume that we're going to plug into our Nexus 4. Once you have that bitstream copied to that micro SD card, eject that micro SD card and walk it on over to your Nexus 4. Plug it into the micro SD card reader on the Nexus 4. Plug in the USB keyboard, plug in the VGA display, connect a USB cable connected to a power supply, turn on the Nexus 4, and the Mega 65 onboarding screen will display. This screen verifies that the Mega 65 is operational. The next thing you wanna do is turn off the Nexus 4. I told you earlier we were gonna format this SD card twice. Well, that's what we're going to do now. And we, to do that, we need to boot into the Mega 65 utility menu. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna turn off the Nexus 4. You're gonna hold down the Alt key on that dirty, nasty Dell keyboard you found in the recycle bin. You're gonna turn on the Nexus 4, and then you're gonna release the Alt key when the utility menu loads. When the utility menu appears, select two, which is the SD card, FDisk, and format utility. Next, you're gonna select zero to select the micro SD card. Type, as it prompts, delete everything plus return to verify that you wanna format the SD card. It's fine, we want to do that. Once the format process is complete, turn off the Nexus 4, ignore the restart options on the menu. The micro SD card can no longer boot the Nexus 4 because we just wiped off the bitstream because we reformatted it. Remove that micro SD card from the Nexus 4. Now, when we formatted it, the Mega 65 utility software created two partitions. One is a hidden partition, it's used by the Mega 65 to store configuration files, and another is the one that we can access. We're gonna go back to the PC and we're going to put the bitstream back on there as well as all the files that we need to boot into Mega 65 mode. Now, we'll go ahead and double click on it and let's see what's on the disk. You'll see it's absolutely nothing. Now, I am going to bring up the disk utilities menu and I want you to look at the contents here. You see that we have type is unused here. Uh, is free is 13.31 gigabytes and used is 27. So there's a small partition here that is used to hold configuration files for the Mega 65. We're gonna be very careful not to do anything within disk utility that will mess up that configuration. We're gonna download three important components necessary on this micro SD card. The first thing we're going to grab is the SD card essentials. Next thing we're gonna do is grab a ROM file, and then we're gonna grab uh, just a .d81 file so that we can play around on the Mega 65 once we boot it. So I'll go ahead and do that at the file host. So let's go back to our browser. And the first thing we're going to search for is SD card essentials. You'll see that we have two options here. We have SD card essentials, SD card essentials, no ROM. We're going to pull the no ROM and then we'll download the ROM separately. 
the majority of you will see this option here. We'll go ahead and download it because we'll take care of the ROM here in just a minute. So that's downloaded. Now let's go ahead and find our ROM file. So if I come into my search and I type ROM, you'll see that we have a couple of options. We have the Mega 65 kernel ROM. We have the C65 ROM dif difference or differential files. We also have the ROM source file. Scrolling down though, you'll also notice that we have open ROMs. If you don't have access to the official ROMs, you can do this project with the open ROMs. Unfortunately, there still are some issues with the open ROM, although that those issues are being taken care of with each release. So if you'd like to try this project but don't have access to the official kernel ROM here, you can use the open ROM. The C65 ROM differential files or diff files will allow you to download the original C65 ROM, which is available online if you do a Google search, and then you can patch it to get it up to speed with the official kernel ROM here. I'm not going to go through that process. If you do a little Googling, you can find that process online. So since I have access to the official ROM, I'm going to click here to download it. And then later, what we'll find is we need to rename that file. We'll come back to that. Next thing we want to do is find a disk image that contains some software we can use once we boot into Mega 65 mode. So I'm going to search for basic and you'll see that there is a basic.d81 image file. The Mega 65 currently only uses .d81 image files. This d81 disk image includes all of the basic program examples you're going to find in the Mega 65 Basic C65 reference. So how handy is that? We're going to download that. And that will give us an image to play with. Now there are a lot of great images that you could download. A lot of great games you can download. Just do a .d81 and you can start to see all of the different software available on .d81 disk images, including some great games and the start of some great applications. Okay, we'll go ahead and minimize our browser and we're gonna come over to our Nexus 4 micro SD card. Again, noting that there's nothing on there. Let's go to our downloads. So I'm going to come down here, open that up in Finder, and then I'm going to drag this file, the bit file back over the bit stream. We'll need that, so we'll drag that over. And we'll go ahead and pop in my basic .d81 disk image. You'll notice that the SD card essentials here are in a compressed file. So I'll double click on that. The Mac will decompress that folder. You'll see all the SD card essentials, no ROM. We're going to dive into there. Then we're going to highlight all of those and copy those right to the root directory of the micro SD card. So we're starting to build our micro SD card with all the files we need. The last thing we need is the ROM file. Now the ROM file comes in this download right here with this information, which is the version of the ROM file, and then it comes as a bin file. So what we're going to do now is rename that mega65, and I want to get rid of the .bin and make that ROM and hit enter. Once we do that, we'll go ahead and drag that over to our micro SD card. And now our ROM is installed on the micro SD card. We'll go ahead and close this window. You can see all the files here. Now, this is the root directory. If you wanted to add additional .d81 files, this would be a good time to do that. You can go to the files host and you can get GEOS and some games and you can drag them on there. For now, this is good enough. I have one .d81 file. I have my bitstream to boot the Nexus 4, and I have all the SD card essentials and the ROM file. So I'm good to go. So I'm gonna come over here, right click, and we're going to eject. Now don't worry, all the files again, are all the links to the files are found in the companion blog post. Everything should be going smoothly at this point, or you're just really confused. Either way, we're gonna get this thing working. But for now, what I want you to do is take that micro SD card, and I want you to insert it back into the Nexus 4 card reader. Use the power switch, turn on that Nexus 4 FPGA. The Nexus 4 should boot after a few seconds and should display the Mega 65 start screen. 
If you see that start screen, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is how frustrated you are using this garbagey Dell keyboard. And not because the keyboard is garbage. The problem is the keys don't match the functions of the keys on a Commodore computer. And basically, the Nexus 4 has now turned into a Commodore computer, the Commodore C65. So what are we to do? Well, we can do the same thing I did on my Combian Pi 400 project, by the way. Check out that video if you want to know how to run the Commodore Vice emulator on the Raspberry Pi 400. Uh, what I did though was to make it more convenient, if you look closely, you'll see I have these wonderful stickers that sit on top of the keys. And I found these stickers on Amazon. There's a link uh, in the companion blog post for these. And you can see that it has all of the keys and all the color functions and all those other Commodore functions. So even though the mapping is a little bit different, this makes it easier by just taking these little labels off, plugging them on the keyboard, and then you can be reminded of which keys perform which functions. And I recommend you go ahead and if you if you plan to use the Nexus 4 long term, go ahead, buy those stickers, find an old Dell keyboard and plop those stickers on there. Hey, that Dell keyboard will finally be useful for something. Now there's another keyboard that's built into this bitstream that comes partly from the development of the Megaphone. If you're not familiar with that, check that out. That is the handheld version of the Commodore 65 that's also a phone. But the Mega 65 Bitstream includes an on-screen keyboard that's useful for the Mega 65 if you want to test your keyboard. There's two ways you can get to that. You can get to it from the utility menu that we talked about earlier by hitting option three, or you can activate an on-screen keyboard using the matrix mode debugger. The matrix mode debugger is activated by holding down the mega button and tapping the tab key. Then we type a few commands, which all of that is in the companion blog post, and it will display a virtual keyboard either at the top or centered. I also have the command to remove that virtual keyboard in the companion blog post if you wanna play around with that. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the virtual keyboard and the matrix mode debugger have display issues. The screen overlaps on the right and the left side as shown. I checked in with Paul, developer of the Mega 65, and he said, yes, this is a known problem. It was designed for 800 wide on the handheld, the megaphone, not 720 of the desktop. So you will notice that that is not an issue with the Nexus 4 that's inherent in the bitstream. We'll see if future bitstreams take care of that. So there are seven onboard micro switches on the Nexus 4, and we're gonna use three of those. The first one is the CPU reset. This resets the FPGA or the Nexus 4 with the current bitstream, but does not clear the memory contents. So think of that as a reset on a computer, You're just gonna reset the computer. If we hit the PROG or PROG key, program key, this resets the FPGA, clears the memory, and reloads the current bitstream. So that's a completely reboot of the device. So if you want the fastest reboot possible, try the CPU reset because it will not have to reload that bitstream. I generally find that CPU reset works well. Occasionally I'll load something and I have to take it all the way down. But the good news is it's only about a 10 second process to boot the bitstream. The other micro switch that's important is the BTND micro switch. This will serve as your restore key. There is also a keyboard emulation for that. That's the page up key. But if you want to hit the restore or the BTND on the Nexus 4 to restore, that will bring up our freezer menu. The freezer menu is important for Mega 65 usage. You really need to learn to use the freezer menu for several options, such as changing your CPU speed and saving states of programs so that you can quickly load them later. There's a lot more features, but that's just a little bit of a preview for you. Okay, now you're probably wondering, wait a minute, what good is a C65 without a nine pin joystick port? Well, you definitely don't have one of those on here. And as far as I know, you can't plug a USB joystick into the USB port where the keyboard is because then you would disable the keyboard and then you wouldn't have a keyboard to operate your Mega 65. See the, see the conundrum we have here? The Bitstream does have a built-in joystick emulator using the keyboard. Now it's not the best, but it is a way you can at least try some software and play games using joystick emulation on the keyboard. So you press the num lock on the keyboard and then joystick number one controls use the WASD format the W goes up, the A goes left, the S goes down, the D goes right, and then the left shift key or the zero 
on the number pad will fire. Now joystick two uses the cursor keys and the cursor keys on the numeric keypad. Space is the fire button. Get out there and try some games. It's not gonna be the best experience because it's not a joystick, but at least you can try them out. Now, the board itself does include these wonderful connectors called P-Mods. Maybe in the future, someone will address our lack of a joystick nine pin adapter with a P-Mod addition. Should be, we just plug that in, have the adapter and plug that in. Not sure if that'll happen. Just depends on how much more development of the Nexus 4 bitstream occurs. Okay, so we have built a Mega 65 on a Nexus 4 FPGA. Let's go ahead and take a look at what you can do with it in this little compilation of software I've run on the Nexus 4 for your enjoyment.
So what's next? Well, if you build your own Nexus 4 based Mega 65 and you have questions, please join me over on the Mega 65 Discord where you can visit the Nexus channel and I will do my best to answer your questions. But the better part is there are people smarter than me out there who can help you answer your Nexus questions. So make sure you join us over there. You know, getting the Mega 65 Bitstream working on the Nexus 4 was a journey. And it started with a YouTube live stream where I had lots of help because I was having keyboard issues. Check out that live stream if you wanna see how we finally troubleshooted to figure out we had keyboard issues. And it was just so much fun to have everybody pitching in from the Mega 65 Discord community to help me solve my problems so that I could bring this video to you today. Okay, so that's it. Hope you enjoyed this build of the Nexus 4, turning it into a Mega 65 using the Bitstream. Again, if you have questions, leave those comments down below. Check out that companion blog post. It's got everything you need. Make sure you subscribe because there's more coming Mega 65 related, Commodore related. I'm going back to that TI computer for those of you that like that. We're hopefully gonna have an unboxing of the Mega 65 when it arrives and I've got some ideas for fun ways to do that. So at this time, there's nothing left for me to say other than Retrocombs out.